Thank you so much for your time, Congressman Gabbard. Thank you, Kyle. There are about 35,000 active military families in the state of Colorado. Yeah. Uh, saw a number of folks in your audience today. What would you like to fundamentally change about how the American military is utilized? By ensuring that our men and women in uniform, those who take that oath of loyalty, willing to lay their lives down in service to our country, are honored by only sending them on missions that are truly worthy of their sacrifice, that uh, are missions actually serving our country's national security, and the safety, security, and freedom of the American people. The sea change in foreign policy that I'll bring as Commander-in-Chief will see an end to the wasteful regime change wars, uh, this new Cold War and nuclear arms race, all of which are not making us any safer and costing us trillions of dollars. Instead, redirect those taxpayer dollars towards actually serving the very real and urgent needs of the American people here at home. Are there any places in the world where you see a role for the U.S. military yes. that isn't currently being exercised? Because I think sometimes people hear you speak and they think, oh, pull back from everywhere, yeah, stay at not home. Not the case. Not the case. I will lead with a foreign policy that's focused on cooperation rather than conflict, no longer being the world's police of the world, but instead focusing on the use of diplomacy, being able to work out the differences that we have with other countries, while also sharing uh, uh, the opportunity in the space to work together uh, on areas of shared interest, things like the coronavirus crisis that we're seeing now affecting so many people around the world. We have to be able to work with China and other countries to be able to prevent an epidemic from occurring. Our military should be focused on those that pose a threat to our country. Uh, we are unfortunately in a place today where Al Qaeda is stronger now than when they attacked us on 9-11. There are a number of reasons why that is the case, but this is where our one example of where our military's efforts should be focused on defeating that threat. You talk a lot about civil liberties online. Yeah. Um, how do you protect American civil liberties online while understanding that threats exist online, that intelligence has to be gathered online to keep us safe? Uh, the Fourth Amendment of our Constitution uh, is, is an important thing, and our founders recognize that the American people should never have to choose between being safe uh, and being free. Uh, we also know the importance of our First Amendment rights, and those must be protected, whether it's person to person or in the interactions uh, that happen online. We get into a dangerous place where we have people in positions of great power, like Zuckerberg at Facebook or like Google, who they themselves are taking on this role to determine which voices should be allowed to be heard or seen on their platforms and deciding which should not be or which should be canceled. Um, they are essentially acting as publishers and should therefore be treated as such under the law and held under those same liability standards while other platforms that allow for the open conversation and discourse to take place without interference from these big tech monopolies uh, should obviously be able to continue to do so. And, and if there's an American that says, you know what, it's, it's my private information if I want to trade it for the convenience of cat videos or whatever else, so be it. It belongs to me, not to a politician to regulate. Absolutely. That's true. That's true. Uh, the government has a role to play in helping to protect consumers against the for-profit big, uh, uh, big tech monopolies as to say, if you want to allow Facebook to monetize your private information and use the pictures that you're posting for whatever uh, and, and leave them out in the open market, then they need to be very transparent with you and making sure you understand very clearly how your information may be collected and used. That's not what we have right now. You are currently suing Hillary Clinton for yes. suggesting that you are a Russian asset. I want to kind of set aside the name-calling portion of this and try to look at the core of the criticism. Because a lot of the same has been said about President Trump. People will name-call and say that somebody's a Russian asset, but set that aside. Your Middle East policy, would that not be an asset to Russia? I don't know how you can ask me to set aside a baseless accusation coming from the former Secretary of State, former First Lady, former U.S. Senator that attempts to devalue the very essence of who I am. I have dedicated my entire adult life 
to serving our country, willing to lay my life down, my service in uniform, two deployments to the Middle East, serving now for 17 years in the Army as a soldier, still wearing the uniform, serving in Congress for seven going on eight years, on the Foreign Affairs, on the Armed Services Committee, on the Homeland Security Committee. So the accusation that she has made isn't just something like, well, this is just something someone threw out. No, this is something that attempts to devalue who I am as a person and what I have dedicated my life to, just as it devalues the same oath of service that every one of our service members has taken. My foreign policy is focused around what serves the best interests of the American people and our nation's national security and how we as the United States can actually be the force for good in the world that represents our values. We have time for one more question. In 2016, you were with Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm. You share a number of the same policy goals. As he surges to front-runner status, and you've had difficulty getting out of single digits, everybody has the right to run. But what's keeping you in the race? What's keeping you from saying, Bernie and I agree on a lot, I'm going to join his movement this year? Bernie's a friend of mine. Uh, we've been able to spend a lot of time together. I agree with him on some issues, disagree with him on others. The reason why I decided to run for president still stands. The qualifications that I bring to be prepared to serve as commander in chief on day one uh, set me apart from the other candidates who are running for president. Combined with the experience that I have of working now in Congress for over seven years across party lines to actually get legislation passed. I think the American people are looking for a new generation of leadership, a fresh perspective and approach to solving problems combined with that experience to be able to execute those plans, to be able to deliver results for them, and to give them the peace of mind that they have a commander in chief of our armed forces who actually knows what they're doing. I bring experience in both of those areas. Congressman Gabbard, thank you for your time. Thank you, Kyle. Great talking to you.